first for the appellant. May it please the court, my name is Jonathan Garagues and I represent the appellant defendant, Marcy Cogburn, in this case. We're here today to talk about three opportunities. The first opportunity we want to talk about was given by my client, Marcy Cogburn, to an aspiring young law student named Everett McGill. This opportunity was an unpaid summer legal internship and afforded Mr. McGill the opportunity to learn the valuable inner workings of a solo law practice. The second opportunity I'd like to speak of today is the opportunity Mr. McGill seized to try and take greedy advantage of the free education that my client bestowed upon him during this internship. After getting everything that my client and Mr. McGill had agreed upon, <clears throat> his greed got the better of him and he filed a lawsuit to try and get money for his unpaid internship. After this greedy pursuit wrongfully succeeded at the trial level, this brings us to our final and most important opportunity. The opportunity that this court has today to right the wrong that Mr. McGill created when he, when he unjustly sued my client for money that he didn't deserve. It's our contention today that the lower court's grant of summary judgment should be reversed and summary judgment granted instead in favor of Marcy Cogburn for three reasons. First, the application of Fact Sheet 71 is inconsistent with Fourth Circuit precedent case law. Second, the correct employment test used should have been the primary beneficiary test. And third, that when applied to the facts of this case, the primary beneficiary test will correctly conclude that Mr. McGill was not an employee during his internship with my client. Our first point, Fact Sheet 71 is incorrect here. North Carolina doesn't give us specific guidance as to what to use when evaluating whether or not someone is an intern versus an employee. <clears throat> but the North Carolina Wage and Hour Act is modeled after the Fair Labor Standards Act. Once we look to, this federal, to these federal cases, we are presented with several different tests available. One, for example, is going to be the uh, totality of the circumstances. Second, the economic realities test. Third, fact sheet 71. And then finally, the primary beneficiary test. All of these have different approaches to how they determine whether an intern is an employee and as such, whether or not they should be paid wages. The trial court granted summary judgment in this specific case just off of the application of Fact Sheet 71. I'm confident that the judges know what this test entails. My confidence is based on the fact that the defense here, the entirety of their brief is the application of this one test, which we contend is inappropriate here. Why is it so inappropriate? As shown in Wolf v. AGV Sports, that focus is too limited and concludes that Fact Sheet number 71 is merely persuasive authority. Wrong to apply that test exclusively, as, when, as was demonstrated here by the trial court. Our second point is what test should be used. <clears throat> we will do today what every appellate court does before us. We're going to look today at the findings of other appellate courts within the same jurisdiction as ours. We need to look no further than McLaughlin v. Ensley. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit has concluded that the general test used to determine if an employee is entitled to the protection of the act is whether the employee or the employer is the primary beneficiary of that work. Well, Counselor, Absolutely. Are we bound by the Fourth Circuit's conclusion? If this case gets appealed again and, and, get, and is evaluated by the Fourth Circuit, yes, in North Carolina, we are going to fall under their jurisdiction. Counsel, why don't we apply the um, economic realities test, which uh, the state of North Carolina has already um, used? The previous cases that we've mentioned here all specifically talk about the, uh, the exact quote that the, the courts should apply the primary beneficiary test as the standard for determining whether or not unpaid internship interns are employers because it comports with Supreme Court precedent and the well-reasoned views of other courts. So all we're doing here is we're looking to what the other, the other appellate courts have decided and we're encouraging the appellate court here today to decide in favor of the primary beneficiary test. May I continue? North Carolina has already decided to use the economic realities test, is that right? I'm not familiar with any specific cases that exclusively use that, but there are several tests available and a plethora of case casework in America that have determined which tests should be used. Well, did this court, under, are you familiar with the, the case of Laborers International versus uh, Casework? I am. And, and did that court apply the economic realities test to that particular set of facts? I have in my notes here. I'm actually not as familiar with that specific point as I should be, as um, I can prepare an, a, a follow-on brief with that to clarify exactly which test they used and whether or not we feel like that would be applicable here as well. Okay. That, that won't be necessary. So uh, under the primary beneficiary test, how exactly do you contend that, that uh, I believe it, it would be your contention that Everett 
receive the, the primary benefit here as opposed to Larson? Absolutely. In Walling v. Terminal, v. Portland Terminal, we explained that the goal of internships is to provide the same kind of instruction as a vocational school at a place in a manner which most greatly benefited the trainee. Well, here, just as you've asked, Mr. McGill, in his own words, after his internship, felt more comfortable with the practice of law. He did the work of a lawyer and learned and learned the practical daily trade practices of lawyering. For example, he drafted motions, spoke with clients, conducted legal research, and really got to experience that day-to-day -day interaction. Didn't Marcy receive a huge benefit, though, uh, in, in the, the, the way that she did not have to hire somebody to replace uh, uh, Frank Hoffman, who left the journey? I'm glad that you asked that, Judge. I've spoken in, at length with my client about this, and it is it is her firm statement that she was not planning on hiring anyone else for this. She has a history of running a solo internship or a solo practice, I'm sorry, a solo legal practice. And throughout the course of that has worked numerous times without, without help of a paralegal, which is why she felt comfortable giving, giving Brant, um, Mr. Hoffman two months off. Regardless of her statement of intention, counselor, was not Mr. McGill doing a lot of the paralegal work while Mr. Hoffman was not in the office? He absolutely was, and a lot of that paralegal work, is, as I just described when Marcy was working solo without the help of a paralegal, is work that a, a lawyer will do day in and day out, which we feel like was a valuable element of what the internship opportunity that she presented to Everett was, was specifically that. Some, some of legal work, as we all know here, all the attorneys in this room, some of that is grunt work, some of it is daily mundane work. But we feel here, we also would like to appeal to the judge's experience. The judges here, I'm sure, have done legal internships in the past. And the things we just outlined, it, drafting motions, speaking with clients, legal research, those are all things that probably I know I in my own experience and probably the judges as well have done in their previous interns, internship experiences themselves. Counselor, if you could point to one thing that Everett did um, while he worked for Marcy that leans toward him um, uh, having an educational experience versus being an employee, what would that be? The fact that I do not recall anything throughout my legal, throughout my law school experience that was comparable to the same things that he did there. And additionally, in the, in the legal internship experiences that I've had myself, and as well as we would ask the judges to consider their own internship experience, the, the descriptive list that we've given here are the exact things that we did, that I did that we would argue that probably the judges have done as well. And well, sort of, none of us have ever done a legal internship. So can you tell us, you know, what is it that he did that, you know, really qualified as a legal internship versus just grunt work? That that's that's also an important distinction. If the judges have not had if the judges have not had done a legal internship themselves, we would also probably point out the fact that I'm confident that our judges have had interns work underneath them and the legal research speaking with clients and drafting motions are things that we would contend that probably the judges here today and many of the other lawyers here have had interns that have worked for them do underneath them. If we were to apply fact sheet 71 instead of the primary beneficiary test, is there, would you still contend that, that Marcy had established an internship with Everett or does fact sheet 71 inevitably result in Everett being classified as an employee? We, we feel like with the nature of the factors of it, it's not elemental, it's not just about whether or not you can meet each criteria. It's literally, they look at all the different factors in, in combination with each other. With that, we do not necessarily agree with the, with the, with the plaintiff that, that that would be as easily said. I see my time is running out, may I conclude? Yes, <clears throat> it's our opinion that the analysis of these facts when combined specifically with the test that we feel is applicable most often in for North Carolina, that Mr. McGill's educational benefit and experience received far outweighed the inconvenience my client Lee willingly incurred to have him work in her office. For the aforementioned reasons, the Court of Appeals should reverse the trial's grant of summary judgment in favor of Everett McGill and grant summary judgment in favor of my client Marcy Cogburn, or in the alternative, remand the case for trial. I thank you for your time.